Compared to most people around the world, Americans enjoy relatively great freedom to do what they want online. A big reason why is the First Amendment, which limits the United States government's ability to restrict its citizens' speech. Having all this freedom means that we get to make choices. But how do we determine which online behavior is okay and which online behavior is wrong? For example, college students might face dilemmas like, is it okay to lie on a dating app or post an edited photo? Is it okay to break up over text? Or is it okay to just skip the breakup and ghost someone? Is it okay to watch a controversial film? What about pornography? All of these things are legal, but should we do them? What makes us think twice about doing them? What makes us feel bad about doing them? Or what makes us avoid doing them in the first place? Well, that's where ethics and norms come into play. In fact, the mere decision to embrace technology, like the internet, may be considered an ethical choice. Some philosophers have long regarded technology as a dark and dehumanizing force. This technological pessimism holds that technological improvements do not lead to an improvement in the human condition, but instead they lock us into a virtual and inescapable cage that menaces our individuality and authenticity. This belief that technology is inherently bad first gained traction more than 200 years ago during the Industrial Revolution. A movement known as the Luddites blamed the rise of industrial mills and advanced factory machinery for the loss of their jobs, and they wanted to destroy this new technology that threatened their livelihoods. More recently, an infamous adherent is Ted Kaczynski. You may know Kaczynski better by his nickname, the Unabomber. He was a former Berkeley math professor who became a recluse and decided that technology was destroying the world. In fact, he wrote a lengthy anonymous manifesto in which he expressed his views and got it published in major newspapers. Now, over the course of about 15 years, Kaczynski engaged in domestic terrorist attacks against Americans in an attempt to start a revolution. In particular, he targeted people who were involved with modern technology, and he killed three and injured 23 others. In the late 1990s, Kaczynski was finally caught, and he was sentenced to life in prison. It was the longest and most expensive investigation in the history of the FBI. In fact, Netflix recently made a miniseries about it. Kaczynski argued that his bombings were necessary to attract attention to the erosion of human freedom and dignity by modern technologies. Many scholars consider Kaczynski's manifesto a work of genius that raises uneasy ethical questions. In recent years, technological pessimism has grown among Americans. For example, a 2020 survey found that 21% of Americans said the internet was bad for society. As artificial intelligence threatens to replace human workers, the Luddite movement could make a strong comeback. Now, in contrast to this bleak viewpoint is a concept known as technological utopianism. This viewpoint believes that technology can be used to create an ideal world, by improving our lifestyles and our jobs. One famous philosopher who supports this idea is Karl Marx. He believed that science and technology would help delegitimize the role of kings and the power of the church and create a better, freer society. More recently, a techno-optimism movement has flourished in the Silicon Valley, centered around the belief that technology, particularly the internet, will improve communication, democratize society, and make the market more efficient. But these tech entrepreneurs, like Mark Zuckerberg, often ignore the negative effects that their inventions have on society. 
Now, between these two extreme positions, techno optimism and techno pessimism, uh, is a position known as technological neutrality. This middle viewpoint believes that technology is merely a tool that can be used for good or for bad. And it's humans who ultimately determine whether technology is used for good or bad. Now, given how saturated we are with technology nowadays, it may seem like we really don't have a choice in the matter, you know, unless we hide out in a remote cabin in Montana like Ted Kaczynski did. But cyber ethics professor Richard Spinello argues that we must recognize that, in fact, we do still have some degree of freedom in our digital world. For example, we can choose to implement laws and program code in ways that protect fundamental human rights, such as autonomy or privacy. So how do we achieve this? Well, it begins by developing sound ethical judgment on how to constrain the negative side effects of technology. Behaving ethically may seem like a matter of common sense, but true ethical dilemmas often involve complicated situations that can't easily be solved through simple intuition or common sense. Ethics is not the same as feelings either, though feelings provide important information for our ethical choices we may feel good even when doing something bad, or we may feel bad when doing something good. Finally, ethics is not a matter of simply following the law. A good legal system certainly incorporates ethical standards, but laws can deviate from what is ethical. For example, a totalitarian regime that tramples on human rights is not ethical. Laws can also be slow to address new problems which often happens when it comes to governments regulating the internet. So that's why ethics and a sound ethical uh, judgment is important to have. Now, there are several different types of ethical reasoning that can help us provide uh, a moral compass when we have to make, moral, make judgments. Uh, I'm going to briefly summarize six major frameworks that you should be aware of. The first framework is what's known as the utilitarian approach. Philosophers such as John Stuart Mill believe that the best action is the one that provides the most good or does the least harm for everyone affected. In e-commerce, that would mean things like selecting the action that produces the greatest good and does the least harm for all stakeholders, such as customers, employees, shareholders, the community, and the environment. Ethical cyber warfare would balance the good achieved through a cyber attack against the harm done to all sides. Thus, the utilitarian approach calculates consequences to determine what is the ethical choice. Second is the rights approach. Philosophers such as Immanuel Kant believe that the best action is the one that most respects and protects the moral rights of those affected. Now, moral rights are open to debate. In cyber ethics, many people believe moral rights include things like the freedom of expression, or a right to privacy, or a right to be forgotten. This approach is based on the notion that humans have an inherent right to choose how to live their lives and that they also have a moral duty to respect others in the same way. A third framework is the fairness or justice approach. Aristotle said that equals should be treated equally and unequals unequally. In other words, what is fair for one should be fair for all. Both favoritism and discrimination are unjust and wrong. That said, treating people equally may not mean treating them the same. For example, a company may hire one candidate over another based on who has more experience and say that is fair. But there is currently a debate over the lack of representation of minorities and women at tech companies. 
leading many to question whether the huge disparity is based on a defensible standard or whether it's the result of discrimination and hence is unfair. Moving on, fourth, we have the common good approach. Aristotle and other Greek philosophers also believe that ethical choices should benefit all members of the community. In order for society to flourish, this philosophy holds, people must accept modest sacrifices for a common good, rather than selfishly protecting their own interests above society's interests. An example of a common good approach would be providing internet access to everyone, including rural communities, even though it might not be cost-effective and take resources away from city dwellers. This approach directly contrasts a controversial philosophy known as ethical egoism, which was exemplified by Ayn Rand, who advocated looking out for oneself above all else. The fifth major ethical framework is what's known as virtue ethics. This is a very ancient approach to ethics. It was developed by the Greeks and by Chinese philosopher Confucius. This philosophy assumes that we acquire virtue through practice. By practicing being honest, being brave, tolerant, and so on, people develop an honorable and moral character that helps them make the right choice when faced with ethical challenges. Virtue ethics asks of any action, what kind of person will I be if I do this? Or is this action consistent with my character? For example, a lawmaker might want to block constituents who criticize her on social media, but what kind of public servant would that make her? Shouldn't she listen to her community's concerns? Finally, there is the religion approach. This is another ancient approach, uh, and it's based on the commands of God. Adherents believe that the ethically correct action is the one that God commands or requires. Under this divine command theory, being ethical is equivalent to doing whatever the Bible or the Quran or some other sacred text or source of revelation tells you to do. But this philosophy is premised, of course, on the existence of God, which is not universally accepted. It's also premised on the interpretation and application of sacred texts, which believers may disagree over. So that's a summary of the major ethical frameworks. It's not a complete list, but I think it represents a broad spectrum of some of the major theories on how to make an ethical decision. Keep in mind that no philosophy is without its problems. We may not agree on what constitutes the common good, for example, or we may not even agree on what is a good and what is a harm. But all of these frameworks deserve careful consideration and can be applied to many of the controversial issues you may face when deciding how to behave online. I'm not going to argue for one theory over another, Instead, I hope you will think about why you see the world in a certain way, what other perspectives are out there, and what tools will be helpful in guiding your decisions as you forge ahead on the information superhighway. Well, this has been a presentation by Professor Grabowski. Thanks for watching. <laughs>